Hello, everyone. My name is Xin Chan. I come from China. And in the next 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about the stream join in Flink. So first, uh, something about me. Actually, I just graduated from Shandong University, and uh, uh, I'll start my postdoc career at York University next month. Uh, last year, I began to uh, contribute to Flink, and my first pull request was submitted in that, that February. Uh, until today, then PR has not been merged yet. Anyway, um, earlier this year, I was honored to become a Flink meter, and my contributions are mainly on SQL table APR. So, uh, there are three parts of my talk. First, I'll try to give a comprehensive introduction to the uh, different stream joins and the stream join related APIs currently supported in Flink. And uh, next, I'll dig into some uh, implementation details about the time uh, bounded join launched in recent versions. And last, uh, from my personal view, I'll try to give some proposals for the future work. Uh, before stepping into the main parts, uh, I assume you've already been familiar with some basic concepts uh, such as uh, inner join, outer join, equi join, lateral join, and cross join. Uh, also, you should know the basic uh, stream processing mechanisms provided in Flink. For example, uh, what's processing time and uh, what's row time, uh, what's the watermark, and how to write a simple stream processing program. Uh, here's an overview of the stream-related API stack in Flink. And in the data stream and the data uh, process function levels, uh, Flink has provided some uh, convenient APIs for users to implement their own join logic. And in the high-level SQL table API, Flink has provided some uh, more advanced stream-to-stream -stream joins. Uh, let's just start from the uh, window join and the window cool group, as I think they may be the, the earliest stream join related APIs launched in Flink. Uh, so, given two streams, S1 and S2, it, it's not a trivial work for, for us to directly join these two streams, since the, the streams are naturally dynamic and contain endless uh, records. Uh, well, maybe a naive solution for this problem uh, would be to cut the streams into uh, different chunks and uh, we only join records belonging to the same chunk. Uh, the, uh, the stream cutting can be achieved by the windowing operations in Flink. And let's take the, the sliding window as an example. Uh, as, as already addressed by, by some guys before, I, I think the, the, the uh, sliding window gets a fixed size and each time it just moves forward a little step. And uh, we already knew that the, the sliding window got some problem. The first one is uh, instead of smooth, uh, slides smoothly, it just jumps from one position to the next. And another problem for the sliding window is uh, there may be some overlaps between different window instances. And uh, th this, this data may be joined multiple times and that will bring a lot of overhead for the, to the system. Uh, so in spite of these shortcomings, I believe the window drawing should have already been widely used in many real-world applications. Uh, here, uh, in the data stream API, uh, Flink has provided a window drawing and a window cool group operations to help users to uh, achieve this. And uh, specifically for both of the two uh, operations, you should be you should first. Uh, 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 specify two uh, key, sec key selectors for the two streams as if uh, uh, just like an uh, equi join predicate. Uh, and uh, records in the same window instance uh, will just be group by, grouped by their keys. And here we just group by the, the records by their shapes. And uh, after that, you can choose an arbitrary window policy on these two streams and then. Uh, end this uh, build process with a, join, a, a flat join on a cool group function. Uh, to see how these functions really works, let's concentrate on a single window instance. And 
as I said before, the records in the single window instance will be first grouped by their shapes, and uh, in, in, in each group, Flink will automatically uh, perform a cross-join for you. And given a join function like this, uh, each time it will take a result from the cross-join re result and uh, output a joint value. Uh, actually, instead of calling this function uh, a join function, I'd prefer to call it a select function, since in this function, all the passed in record pairs should have already been uh, evaluated to meet the join uh, predicate. Uh, we just need to choose some fields from the records and uh, assemble a new result, just like a, a select statement in SQL. And uh, in comparison, uh, the flat join function, I think, is, works more like a join function since it allows users to uh, first uh, 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 evaluate the, the past in record with some extra join predicate and then emit zero, one, or, or even more result at a time. So here, if, if the past in record it, it, uh, doesn't meet the, the extra join predicate, we can just swallow them. And uh, we, uh, uh, although the flat uh, join function can be used in a more flexible way, uh, it, it can only process a single record pair at a time. And that means it, it is impossible for the users to have a, a global view of which record in current window group has been successfully joined. And thus, to perform an uh, uh, outer join, we should use a QGroup function. And in this function, all the records in current group will be ingested all at once, and the user can process them uh, on their need. And for example, if we are just performing a, 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 red, red, a right outer join, and uh, unfortunately, there's no qualified rules from the left, we can just emit a non-padding result like this. Uh, next, let's take a look at the, uh, some join relate, uh, stream join related low level APIs. And um, uh, the broadcast state pattern is just a variance of the connected stream. I'll only cover the former one there and leave the connected stream to the next part. So the broadcast state pattern can be used to, when you want to join a high throughput stream with a low throughput stream. So how low throughput the stream should be? Well, it should be low enough to fit into the main, to fit into the state for, for each process function instance. And to define a broadcast state pattern, you should first declare a map state descriptor like this and use this descriptor to uh, uh, initialize a uh, broadcast stream. Uh, don't be fooled by the pattern name. The, the broadcast state pattern really does not broadcast the state for you. Instead, it just broadcasts the, the low throughput stream. And the low throughput stream actually should be taken as an update stream for the state. And after that, you could just perform a key by operation on the high throughput stream and connect these two streams. Uh, since the the broadcast state pattern is not a symmetric operation. Uh, you should always call the connect method on the kit stream. Uh, in the broadcast uh, process function, uh, it goes two main methods for us to implement. And according to, uh, to their names, it's not hard to imagine that uh, the first process element method is responsible for the kit stream and, uh, and, and the other method is, should be used to process elements from the broadcasted low throughput stream. And both of the methods uh, are given access to a local state, a map state created by the, by the uh, state descriptor we mentioned before. And however, the process element method can only uh, read the state, as uh, the state is designed for caching the low throughput stream only. And suppose that we got three instances of the process function, and just as expected, the low throughput stream will just be broadcasted to each instance of the function. Uh, uh, here, to keep the consistency, we must ensure that all the broadcast, all the process broadcast uh, element method in the different instances should be deterministic and do exactly the same thing, so that we can we can keep each local state identical as if they are being broadcasted. And uh, for the high throughput 
a case stream, we should just, uh, uh, each element in it should just be forwarded to a specific uh, uh, instance and uh, perform join with the upside uh, cached record. Um, uh, you should be aware that if you don't manually catch the record from the kid stream, uh, the join result here may be incomplete. Let's see. Uh, the, the, the red one record, when it comes, there's no cache in the upside stream, so nothing happened there. And let's just take a simple summary here. Uh, the APIs are just I just mentioned, uh, they are not bound to stream join. Actually, uh, if you know how they work, you can use them to implement uh, everything you, you want. You can use them to do joins, to do pattern matching, to do complex event processing, and uh, or just emit an infinite stream of hello worlds. Um, and let's move to the next part, the SQL table API level. And all the joins in this uh, level get some uh, uh, deterministic semantics. So let's just from the easiest one, the simple lateral join. Uh, actually, if I just remove the, the word simple, this lateral join could be one of the most import, uh, uh, complicated operators in SQL, since the SQL, uh, SQL executor may have to generate a completely new table for each row from the, the left. But don't worry, uh, what we are talking here is just a, a flat map function. That is, uh, for each record in S, we can use a user-defined table function or an unnest operator uh, to create a tiny set, and we just join the record with that generated set. Let's see if the data for this two uh, uh, record uh, to the for these two rows are like that. And we just need to join the rows with each element from their, their own arrays. So uh, before going further, uh, it's better for us to have a better understanding of SQL on stream. Mm, actually, everyone knows that SQL was initially designed for uh, querying static tables and uh, in Flink table SQL API, we have always been trying to unify the semantics of SQL on um, streams and the SQL on tables. Uh, that's not an easy topic for me to, to talk there. I'll try to just give uh, uh, maybe informal yet simple explanation about this. So given the data stream S, uh, for all the records we have consumed from S, they can be put into a, a table. And for an arbitrary query, uh, we must ensure that the query on uh, the, the results of the query on the table should be exactly identical, identical with that uh, on the data stream uh, before time step, P, uh, time step T. Uh, so the next question is how to convert a data stream to a corresponding table. Uh, well, actually, a data stream can be taken as a change log of a table. And uh, according to the types of the elements in this change log, we can separate the data stream into three different types. Uh, the append stream, the, the retract stream, and the upstream stream. So for the first uh, append stream, you should uh, you could just take the table as a queue structure, and each record from the stream will just be appended to that queue. And for the second retract stream, you can take the table as a list structure, and the streams is just a series of operations for, for, the, for, the, for, for add and remove. And for the third after stream, you could take the table as a map structure and the stream just contains a series of map put and map remove operations. Uh, when using the upstream, stream, uh, you should first choose some, f some fields to be a unique, here, unique key here. But know that the unique key is just not equivalent to, to the primary key in relational database because the unique key here uh, could be now. And there's another important factor, the, the time attribute. Actually, it can be taken as a common field for the, for the append stream uh, and retract stream, while in an up upstream stream, it can only be considered as a special metadata. 
then cannot be participate, uh, participated in uh, 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 expression evaluation. And for these two ki uh, for these three kinds of joints, Flink has provided two kinds of uh, corresponding um, joints, and uh, they are the the time bounded join and uh, uh, materialized table join. Let's take a look at the re uh, the materialized table join first. Actually, it can be written as a common equijoin like this, and the join executor will continuously convert the two streams uh, into into tables and join the records from each size. Uh, when when we retract a stream from the table, all the gener all the results generated before according to the retracted stream will also be retracted by sending some retract some special retract messages to the downstream operators. Um, Note that as the, both of the two streams are fully cached in the state, the state size may grow infinitely. Uh, in Flink, to prevent this, we have introduced a, a time to live config for for the state. And you can just set it with uh, with i uh, with idle state retention time method in the stream configuration. Um, as we are in in a re research track, I have to say that the the current version of materialized table join uh, is sort of factory driven design. Um, the state retention time just bring a lot of uncertain factors to the query result, and thus it it should be used with careful. Here I list three scenarios that uh, I think the materialized table join should be applicable. And the first one is, uh, you know that the cache size will never exceed uh, your state capacity. And in that scenario, you don't need to set the TTL for state. The second scenario is that you set the TTL and meanwhile your data will be expired uh, in naturally after a period of time. Uh, for instance, if you are joining two session IDs and you know the session will expire in 30 minutes, and once a session ex is expired, the, the session ID will never come again. And uh, the last scenario is that you just want to perform an equijoin and you don't really care about the result. And the last join type I'd like to introduce in this talk is a time-bounded join. As I, as I mentioned, it's a join append, uh, applied on append streams, and to activate it, the join predicate should contain a conjunction of an equi-join predicate and a time-bound on both sides. Uh, it's just like for each row, we define a qualified time span uh, on the offside stream, and we have we'll have a deeper insight into this join later. So here's a summary of the stream join related APIs supported in Flink. Since the power of the connected stream pattern is just affected by other components, I just mark it as a special case here. And uh, you can see from one. 0 version to 1.15 version from discrete window join to continuous time stream to stream join. Uh, the, the support for this join operation has been enriched a lot, and I think it also reveals an overview forward of the whole project. So most on to the next part, uh, let's discuss some implementation details about the time-bounded join. And maybe this part is a little verbose, but I think it's a, a general pattern for us to perform a stream-to-stream -stream join in Flink. Uh, as introduced in previous parts, the time window join only works for append streams. And once, one interesting point here is that uh, an append stream can be just considered as a sequential scan of a time order table. So the problem of joining two append streams can just be considered as joining two time ordered tables with only one sequential scan on both sides. And let's say we have, if we have a stateful scanner like this, uh, the scanner owns the ability to catch some uh, records it has seen before, and uh, and if we could make sure that the qualified row from the both sides just 
can cover by this scanner. The drawing can be performed like this. And I think most of you should have me notice that this stateful scanner works just like a sliding window that slides smoothly. And that is why we call this join time windowed join in, in the documentation. But since we already already got another window join here, so I just use the, the notation time bounded join in this talk. And to active a uh, time bounded join, we first need an active join predicate which can make the join operator uh, works in parallelism. And we also need a time bound predicate like that. To see how this predicate works given a row from the left stream, the qualified rows from the right stream should be contained in a time span decided by the x and y values. And the time bound is uh, actually a symmetric uh, predicate. It can also be rewritten as another form on the other side, like this. And recall that we, uh, we need to catch the records from the both streams. Uh, uh, actually, the, the, the cached record size uh, is also decided by the x and the y values. And here, the, the size doesn't mean the number of rows we, we cache. Instead, it just uh, refers to a time span of the cached rows, just like the, the uh, t just like a time window size. And knowing this, let's see how the join is performed. Internally, the time join, uh, time bounded join is uh, implemented implemented with the connected stream pattern. The main logic is written as, uh, in a kid cool process function. This function provides the uh, process element methods like the the process function we have seen before, and it also gives us the the. Uh, it, it, it can also enable us to get the current records time and watermarks, uh, and we could re register timers on both of the street, uh, both of the times uh, from the two streams. And also here we use a map state to catch the records from the both sides. And the key for the map state is just the row time, and the value is just a list of records belonging to that time. Uh, yeah, next, I'll go, I'm going to use two flowcharts to explain how the process element method and the on-timer method works. Uh, in a process element me method, when receiving a new record from L, from, uh, we, we will first update the current record time and watermark. Uh, then we will check the right stream to, to uh, right cache to see if there are some qualified rows in that cache that L can be joined with. And if the time span uh, of this is called uh, overlap of the frame frame uh, of the green frame which indicates uh, the cache and there, then we must prop the cache to join the, the, the rows and next we must check uh, if the current row should be if the current row should be cached for later use and that is decided by uh, by uh, qualified by defined uh, by Choosing a qualified span decided on the upside, uh, upside operator time. Here, if this record is time step is greater than the lower bound of this green uh, time span, it should be cached. And the last thing we should do is to register a timer to clean the cache. Uh, here, we must notice that when to clear a record from the right catch uh, is, is it actually decided by the watermark of the upside stream. And uh, compared with the process element uh, method, the on-timer method is relatively simple here. Uh, when triggering by a timer, we just need to calculate the expiration time according to the current watermark and remove the cached rows whose time is less than the expiration time. Uh, and if the cache is still empty, we must actual another timer to clean the, remo the removing record in current cache. 
yeah, the time to clean should be there. And with the flowcharts I just explained, you could try to implement your own join stream to stream join logic for your business. But be careful, there are some more factors we should to uh, consider. And the f first problem is, uh, what's the result of a time-bounded join? I'll read some articles about this question and someone argues that, like the uh, group by operation, uh, stream join will lead to uh, the table. And that is true for the materialized table join, but seems not hold for the time-bounded stream join, as in fact, the, f the result for this kind of join is still a data stream. Uh, and as I said before, you should be always uh, careful with the time attribute. When converting a join result, result to a data stream, you must ensure that only one row time field can be con uh, is contained in the result row. And for for other rows, uh, for other time rows, you could just cut cast it into uh, ordinary time step fields using the cast function, like this. And now that we know the, the result for a time-bounded join is still a data stream, the output records must be aligned with the watermarks. Uh, for common um, process function, a record is considered to be fully processed uh, after the process element method returns. Uh, but that assumption doesn't hold for the process function with data caching. Uh, for example, in the time-bounded join, uh, the green file and the seven will be just cached for later use. And if we just send the watermark to the downstream operator, the operator will get a signal that all the records whose row time less than eight are late. Uh, but actually that is just a normal case for the, for, for the join. And to solve this problem, uh, the join operator will hold back the watermarks by subtracting a fixed value from each watermark. And now everything's back to normal. And the last problem I'll explain is uh, about the integrated problem for the joint result. As presented in previous part, uh, uh, I said that uh, the execution results for a SQL on tables and on streams should be exactly the same. Uh, but, but in real applications, uh, due to data lateness, uh, here R, uh, R1 may not be exactly identical with R2. Mm, let's see an example. Here, error is actually a late data, since it comes after the watermark. But as shown in, in here, uh, even error is late, there's, some, uh, there's still some records from the right stream that can be joined with it. And now we got two options here, to just drop error as if it never comes, uh, or we pre uh, preserve error and join as many results as we can. And in current version of Flink, we choose option two. And maybe in the future, uh, we need a switch here. Mm, in the na last uh, few minutes, I'd like to share some proposals for the future work. Actually, all these pr proposals are somewhat related to the, the stream join. And of course, the first proposal would be to support more kinds of stream joins in Flink. And from my own point of view, a stream to stream join can be conducted only we can find uh, some uh, efficient policy to catch the uh, to to clean the cache, and currently I know the the community is just working on a time version join. And uh, I just wonder if we could implement a one to one stream join here, and uh, that is if we all if we already know that the, the join result is a one to one mapping uh, for the two tables. And uh, whenever a cached record is successfully joined, we can just remove it immediately. And to en enable this join, maybe we need some new mechanisms like query kings. And my second proposal is about better state support. As, 
uh, especially we need a sorted map states to manipulate the data, the cache in a more efficient way like that. And also maybe we could try to en enable the rocks DB backend for the operator state as I think is an in in essential part uh, to implement a theta join. And my third proposal is to support separated watermarks for connected stream. Uh, in current version, the watermarks for the two streams are forcibly synchronized. And that means uh, the watermark value of the left stream should uh, always be exactly the same with that of the right stream. Uh, separating watermarks make, makes it possible for us to track this, to trace these two streams in an asynchronized way. Uh, it's just like uh, we, we adding an uh, offset between the two streams. And the, the separated watermarks mechanism can be used to, to do some cache size optimization in the time-bounded join. Uh, let's see, given a time-bound predicate like this, as I said before, the cache sizes are actually decided by the x and y values. So what will happen if we introduce an offset between the two streams? Here, you see, the, the qualified time with the qualified time span on the right stream unchanged, uh, the cache size for the right stream just drops from 50 to 30. And we keep it if we keep it going, the cache size for the right stream just drops to 20. And and if it continues, uh, while the, the cache size for the right stream drops to 50, but the cache size for the the left stream just increased to, to five. Uh, so we can get a conclusion that with uh, uh, the, 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 the cat size of the two, two streams can be somehow optimized to be the minimum value, and that is x plus y. And my first proposal from uh, is about query optimization. And this is actually an old topic, maybe from last century. But SQL on streams just bring it some new challenges. Uh, first, uh, I think maybe we need some specific rules when generating a data stream program from the input SQL. And we all know that uh, Flink use QLSight to do the, the query parsing and uh, generating the logical plan. And, uh, the, and it enables us to just uh, uh, plug in some new rules to do a better optimization for streams. And uh, also to make the stream uh, execute more efficiently, we, uh, we can add a smart enough approach to automatically set the parallelisms for each operator in the generated stream pip pipeline. And that is actually a, a, a problem since without this mechanism, the SQL is hard to be applied in real world uh, production environments. And uh, the reason why we introduced the SQL and the table is just we don't, we don't want the user to care more about the, the, the low level data streams. And without knowing this, so it's impossible for users to set the, uh, set the parallelism for them. And uh, in, in the long term, we can even consider making adaptive query organization. That is, uh, uh, for example, when data skew happens, the system will just be aware of this and automatically modify the parallelisms of some uh, operators uh, or even changing the execution plans for the current SQL on the fly. Uh, well, that seems to be a, a, a distant goal from now, but I think uh, it will eventually be achieved one day. Okay, uh, that's all I want to share today. And thanks for your attention. Wish you a pleasant day in Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Yep. 
So I noticed early on you mentioned uh, streams with retractions. How do you deal with stateful operators that process streams with retractions? Uh, in current version, uh, the, these are just, uh, the, the rows are just put into the cache and the duplicate, duplicated rows uh, do not take more space since we do some, some uh, abstract, uh, extraction here. And when, uh, when, a record, when a row is retracted, uh, we, just, uh, we just join that row with the offside stream. And that means for each retracted row, we actually generate two, uh, we, we just join it uh, two times. The first time we generated the result and the second time we, we, we must know which of the generated result should be retracted. Any other questions? Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very okay. much for your presentation. Thank you.